it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, we're not too far away. We're just in Marina del Rey. Uh, today with me, we have three graduate students, Mike Robenstein, and Harris Chu, and uh, Jacob Everest. And we all work together in the same lab called the Polymorphic Robotics Lab. So what I wanted to entertain you during the lunch time is something we've been doing for many years. I think it's now nine years, called self-reconfigurable robots. And the software, we, the control software we write to control such robots, um, you can summarize that by we call it digital hormones. I'll tell you what it is. OK? So I wanted to, first of all, I want to dedicate this talk. I've been giving this talk many places to my advisor, Professor Herbert Simon. I don't know how many one of you know about him. He's a Nobel Prize winner for economics, and he's also the funding father or father for artificial intelligence. And he passed, unfortunately, he passed away in 2001. So he has been my advisor since 83 to 89, and I learned tremendous amount from him. And he's basically the model of my not only the scientific research, but also life in general. OK. So what I wanted to tell you today, we have 50 minutes, right? Supposedly end at 1 o'clock. We can go a little over. So because we started 10 minutes late. So I'm trying to make it in one hour then. So we'll tell you a little bit who we are, what do we do. And then I tell you what is exactly self-reconfigurable robots. Why is it interesting? And then the approach we take to build such interesting robots. And possibly, if we have time, tell you a little bit about applications and implications of such system. First, who we are. OK, we call ourselves polymorphic robotics lab, meaning robots that can become many different shapes. Morph means shape, OK? And fac uh, we have uh, two faculty members and two computer scientists and uh, five PhD students and two masters at the moment. So the three guys sits here, they're, in, they're all PhD students here. Our lab, the mission of our lab is to, to build self-reconfigurable systems. Such systems can be robots, which we're going to talk about today. It can be also software systems, agents, and, uh, and even mechanical structures or other structures, and even human organization and biological organisms. There are lots of phenomena about self-reconfiguration in the nature, so we are trying to capture or to research in this, in this broad area. In the past, we have done some interesting stuff. Uh, one of them, th if you see there's a picture here, the middle guy is a robot we call Yuda that does indoor navigation. In 1996, it showed up in Alan Alder's Scientific American Frontier for by winning the second place in a national competition of robotics. This uh, medium-sized one are the soccer robots. They are autonomous systems that play soccer against each other. So in 1997, our team, we call ourselves Dream Team, win the world championship in Japan, in Nagoya, Japan. And I'm going to show you a short movie of that. And then these little guys are the reconfigurable modules, early version. And then we have a bigger one, and that's the one that you see on the table. <coughs> so first, the soccer robot. Do we have a phone? Oh. OK. I figure Google should have everything here. Yeah, that last one. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. 
Great. That's okay. Oh, I can play again. <clears throat> okay. Those are not robots, by the way. <laughs> CNN did this because after we win the world champion. And that year we have eight graduate students and five robots. Uh, these five robots, they all have cameras, all the decision making things. And the field is about, about half of the size of this room, eight meters by five meters. And they're green. Go, the two goals are colored, one yellow, the other green. Uh, the floor is green and the wall is white and the ball is red. So these robots, you turn on the power, blow a whistle, and they start hitting each other. And that year, we scored nine goals out of 12 goals of the entire tournament. Unfortunately, the two goals, one of the nine, two of the nine goals are against ourselves. So you can see the problems there. Okay. All right, so that's 1997. So then after that, we started working on the self-reconfigured robots. So what do I mean by self-reconfigured robots? These are the robots that are eventually were able to change their shape and the size by themselves. Depends on the environment, the task you want them to do. So you can imagine such a robot sees a pipe or a very narrow space, and they can become a snake, go through it. Afterwards, if they need to climb stairs or obstacles or slope, they can grow legs. I mean, literally, grow legs. And then if the terrain is downhill, they can simply become a ball and roll. And sometimes we joke with our friends, we're trying to build a baby version of the T-1000 robots in Terminate 2. Okay. Of course, we don't have the liquid metal. All we have are the small modules you see here. They should be able to look for each other and connect to each other, and forming different shape. And the possible applications could be space, military application, underwater, and many other possibilities. So one possible <coughs> application is for space, because Right now, NASA is building a lot of robots for different purposes. And you got to have a rover. Uh, you have uh, robots that specially designed to, to climb some very steep slope. And you have this arm stick on the moving things around. But even though they are successful in the past, uh, we don't want to continually build too many special robots because there's so many things to do up there, on the moon, on the Mars. If you have too many of them, it would be too expensive to ship them there. So the goal here is to build one robot with lots of modules and ship them there, and they can change. Say, today you want them to dig, they forming a digging machine. Tomorrow you want them to explore, and then they all s separate and spread out in the area, do certain things. And the day after, you maybe you want them to do some construction. So you change them. That's the deal. So there's a word, key word there is retasking and uh, reusing, because the modules, you can use them for different purpose. Recovering, if you encounter some unexpected failures, uh, these robots can uh, recover. For example, if you step into some crack and you, your leg stuck there, right? Normally, if you if you're normal robots, you're gonna stuck there forever. And this guy can literally cut his leg and keep going. Okay. And uh, also, last one is reducing the cost. So because you can you can use the same module to do many different purposes. So this Superbot project is something we call modular multifunctional 
and self-reconfigurable. And just in the last two weeks, the movies you're about to see here has been pop up in many, many places on the internet. So now you can type Superbot on Google and you get a lot of hits for that. So it's something that we were, we are very happy about and it was a surprise to us too. So here is a picture of that vision for space. You, you see that on the left hand side there is a robot trying to climb really steep slope and there is a rover on the moon and there is a something fly inside the space shuttle and you can take one of these module, put a little jet there and then they can fly in the microgravity environment. And also you can put this all together with a long chain and then they can act in like a long arm. And you can also put them into a human figure to be an astronaut's look and, and to do uh, assist in the astronauts. Our original goal, this is Superbot project was uh, started in 2004, <coughs> sponsored by NASA. The original goal is to be able to build 100 of these modules, pack them into a very tight configuration, like you see on the left side, the cartoon there and they have you fly over a desert and drop this package on the desert and then they wake up and then they reconfigure into a rolling track find a sand dune nearby and roll to the sand dune at the bottom of the sand dune it will reconfigure to become a leg the position, uh, configuration and climb the sand dune once on, the, on top of the sand dune and they will reconfigure into a little structure you see there to protect a group of seeds with little water and soil inside and sits there for a week or two until the, the seeds sprout into, um, into some little plants. That's our original goal. And that was how Super Bowl started. And NASA, uh, at that time, we said they will give us $28 million just do this. Now, they cut the budget, so we are suffered, and now we are only building 20 modules. I'm not going to the desert. So. But I thought it's interesting to, to show you the original uh, implication. So up to now, we have completed 20 modules. We have done a lot of multifunctional demos. You will see the movies I'm going to show you. And we have did some limited version of self-reconfiguration. So. So I'm going to show you some of those uh, little by little. And then please, if you have a question while you are not eating, you can ask me. And, OK? So this is uh, the 20 modules all together, when fresh out of press and all uh, assembled. So we took a picture before we, we, um, we kind of uh, contaminate them or dirty, make them dirty. So inside each module, this one, for example, <coughs> it has three degrees of freedom. So you can do, this is a pitch, yaw. I never, I never remember which one is pitch, which one yaw. And in the middle one, you can roll. The middle rotation right now allows you to continue roll, but we can only control it for like 270 degrees controlled movement. And the both of these side can be plus or minus 90 degrees. These modules also have six connectors. In a sense, uh, there's one connector in there in the middle. If you later on, you want to see in the middle. You have front connector, back connector, up, down, left, right. So other modules can dock and connect and form in different shapes. Uh, it has two little microcontrollers, 8 mega 128, and runs the C program. A lot of, a lot of you are interested in about the software here. Uh, we are running a small real-time operating system called AVRX, and uh, you be able to program real-time tasks, multi-threads, and you can have one task control motor one, and the other task control the communication. Each of the connectors have infrared communications, allow them to talk to each other, and also allow them to see each other 
when in some distance. So may, all the six co connectors all have this capability. So you can talk to six neighbors, up to six neighbors if you want. And also have internal sensors. It can sense a orientation that has uh, 3D accelerometers inside. And uh, also have current sensor, voltage sensor, other sensors in it. Okay. So let me show you some of the movies first. First of all, I want to show you the movement of a single module. Then I'll show you the movement of a different configuration. Then I'll show you how do they reconfigure. Okay, so just step by step. We have many movies. So one module, in some sense, is already a complete robot because they can move forward, backwards, left, right, upside down, or any way you want. Okay? And they have their own batteries and control and everything. Sensor, actuators, and controls are all there. Some gates are funny. For example, you can even have these uh, genetically algorithm discovered a, what do we call a junking uh, movement. And that looks like someone had, had too much drink. And that was Jacob kicking it, yeah. So that just shows that single module, you can have programmed to do a lot of different activities. And also, we use onboard batteries. Oops, sorry, I didn't realize that has a sound. So that's just a movie shows. We one time we did it, have the modules running back and forth on the hallway for about 700 meters. So it's on battery, and we're using uh, iPod batteries here, four iPod batteries, last about a little bit more than two hours, I'll say, and uh, less than three probably. Okay, and I mentioned early, you can have sensors. So in this case, this is Mike trying to drink some uh, Coke. He put a cup on top of this uh, module, and he wrote a program. No matter how you tilted the base, it never spill. That's great for waiters when you deliver food in restaurant. But it's terrible when you're trying to drink it <coughs> because the cup doesn't, doesn't uh, tilt. So he has another movie show that when you're trying to drink it, it's really difficult. But this is an example of feedback control in single module. Okay. And they also can synchronize and they can collaborate when you are, if you let them communicate to each other. In this case, four modules are doing what we call synchronized swimming. Just, uh, just have them doing the same thing. Uh, we might have a better movie in the future and to show that. Okay. Now, those are the single modules, right? And imagine you connect them together. What kind of a configuration you can, you can come up with? It basically, in principle, it's endless. You can, first of all, you can chain them together with a long snake, if you like. Or you can have them grow legs on the side. You can have a centipede. Put as many as legs you want. And you can have trees, arbitrary trees. Okay? And you can have loops by connecting them into a loop. And then on top of a loop, on the side of a loop, you can have legs if you wanted to make a, uh, say, octopus. You make a loop in the middle, you get eight legs on the side, and you get an opt octopus. So this is a picture that uh, you see there are different configurations. Uh, and the front is a four-legged creature. And then there is a, a two, two kind of a branching thing. Uh, and then there is a snake with four module and five module. And there's the three modules like standing up. OK. Now, by manually configure all these different configurations, you take one and say, oh, today I wanted to program a six legs. You basically grab maybe nine of these modules, connect, right? And then you load your program. 
each module will run in the same program, and then they will, and you have the remote control here, and you turn it on, and they will move. Let me just uh, do it for you. So this is a remote control. It has a little radio inside. If I turn them on, after six seconds, they will wake up and do different things. So this one will do a little catcher pro one. Those two are communicating to each other uh, and then doing a synchronized catcher pro. Okay? And I can turn off the motor and then they stop. And I turn on the motor, they continue. And I can turn off the power. So later on, if you want, you can play a uh, little bit, not too much. Okay. <coughs> so you see, okay, uh, these are the longer, one case is a longer caterpillar. This is a stronger caterpillar with a larger uh, wave. This is something that we did at the Marina del Rey beach. We get tired inside of indoor programming, so we go out. So maybe you can think of a Google, think of something that you go walk on beach, it would be nice. And people come and say, because I show this on the east coast and a cold place. And they say, wow, you must spend a lot of time on the beach. <laughs> yeah. So you see that it makes uh, interesting footprints along the way. <clears throat> Mike also experienced when he was doing this on the beach, e seagulls come. And they were curious about what is this? And they, can they eat it? So it was funny. That's the sound of the beach. So. And also the wind. So the black skin is actually to prevent the sand to get, get into the module, okay? And it's a very high-tech thing. It's actually it just ladies' socks, we put it on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then there are other locomotions for chain configuration, or the, if you have a T configuration. You have a two legs in the front with a tail, I'll show you. The one thing about the chain is you can move sideways. And also you can move like a butterfly. This is the T configuration. Basically, two legs in the front with a little tail looks like a scorpion. And uh, if you have a longer tail, the tail can certainly stand up trying to do something to you. One thing we talk about, we never did it. This can be used by, say, law enforcement. If you wanted to, to arrest some bad guys, and you, you let these robots, and quickly the robots will surround your body and tie it up, and you kind of uh, uh, under the rest. So whatever. And they can also climb, as I mentioned, to climb steep slope. This is indoor, maybe close to 45 degree angle on a carpet um, because the center of gravity is so low and they can climb really steep slope. We also did it in the LA, what's the name of the creek? I, what was it? Huh? Flo, okay. Florent Creek or whatever. You know the LA River, sometimes they dry up, and there's a bank, it's about 45 degrees. So we we put our robot there and have a climb. All these are because uh, we have a part of a, uh, as a agreement with NASA. We have to demonstrate these modules will be able to run on battery for one kilometer, able to cr climb really steep slope, and even sand dunes. So we're working on that. This is a sand dune climb. Again, it's on the beach. Uh, it's not too successful because the leg will dig into the sand. So it doesn't move the body too much. So we are thinking all sorts of ways to improve it so eventually it can climb a sand dune. There's one nice sand dune park in 
Manhattan Beach Park. I don't know if you know about that place. And uh, eventually, we're going to be able to climb that sand dune there. This is also using a caterpillar trying to climb the sand dune. And again, because the weight, uh, the weight and the sand softness, it doesn't make too much progress. Okay. And for fast movement, rolling track is an interesting one. So in this movie, is a six module configured into a loop, stand up and roll. And Harris is in charge of that, and they're working hard to make it better, to make it smoother and run faster. In the future, we should be taking these to a maybe a, a running field with a 400 meters, have them run two and a half circles, and then we, we deliver what we promised to NASA. So interesting part of the rolling track is they should be able to stand up if they in, in case they fall down. You look carefully how it stands up. And then, then they can turn along the way. There's another way to stand up. And then keep going, OK? And also, in order to able to control their moving direction, you can put a two rolling track together. Okay. For some reason, I can only click once. Hmm? I don't know. Okay, let we see that later. This is another interesting behavior. You can have a rope between two buildings, and this robot be able to climb from one end to the other. Okay, Jacob has been working on this too. So, this is a movie that we did on the roof of our parking lot. You see that they have a little grabbers. Right now, it's just the two tubes that they can twist, hold on it, and move the other leg. And let it go and twist the other one, let it go, like this. Go. And we're hoping that by having the rope vertical, it, can able to, it will be able to climb up to climb a building or go down to do some other. Yeah. That's the traffic you hear on the Lincoln Avenue. OK, for tree-shaped robots, you can certainly have something like a human leg. Not quite human leg. Our leg bent this way, this leg bent sideways. But uh, it's uh, tough to have it balance and then moving along. And you can have more leg. This is a six-legged six -legged, uh, robot and then move a little bit similar to the Star Trek, not Star Trek, uh, Star War thing, that it, the big guy, big robot thing. OK. And I also mentioned they have internal sensors. You already see this movie. And these two movies shows that they were able to stand up by themselves. Each module can lift, is powerful enough to lift the other two modules if you have them straight. However, it's not strong enough to lift three, four, or five. So in order to stand up with four or five modules without falling down, they have to constantly use the center of gravity information to allow them to move in a funny way to stand up. That's the two movie shows that. You can also have an arbitrary tree with one root. It's like you're standing on one leg. Every module is reporting to each other their center of gravity information, and then they compute where's the global center of gravity, and then they be able to move and standing on that one leg. So these are useful for future when you 
walk on a very tough uh, terrain and be able to stand on one leg and move in a certain way. You see, they, they are very careful because it's not easy to have them stand on one side. So if I put them like this, if I don't touch them, it will fall down easily. Because right now, it's, they are not, uh, uh, they're not apply force. They just, but this is OK. But if you touch it, it will fall down. OK. They can also do other interesting thing, like bury themselves into a pile of uh, peanuts for the packing, packaging, and go through a rubble and then into a pipe, and then after the pipe, climbing a little slope. We tried that bury thing on the beach. I dig and dig and didn't go too deep because when you're coming this way, the sand is coming back. And so we have to think more. Okay? And then we also want them to work on soft objects. This is a gate that designed to be able to roll on a net. So it needs little help by providing a little gripper at the end of the thing. So right now we just use a little help. And you will see they kind of a one side roll, the other side roll, and the middle roll, and keep rolling on the net. And you can apply the same gait on the net uh, with a little help. By the way, people download this movie, and then someone even added on music to the movie. <laughs> really nice music. And synchronize all this movement. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so that just to give you a, a flavor how eventually it will be able to move on the net. And also carry sensors. One interesting feature of these robots is suppose you have some special tools and you wanted to be able to, to have the robots carry it. As long as that tool has a standard connector, you can connect to it. So we have a part that has a little camera and a wireless communication. You can connect to them. And then they will talk to this module through the infrared. And they become a part of the robots. Suppose you have a screwdriver or a glove, whatever, and you can put it on with the standard connector. And then it has a special module that you can do things with it. So that is a uh, the climbing configuration you saw earlier and uh, with the part at the back of the robot and this is where this is what the robot sees when they move and you can send the command to the robots every turn left and right in other words you can leave the robot somewhere else and you're sitting in this room and you see what the robot sees, and you can control it kind of remote control thing. And you see Jacob sits there. That's, I think that's Mike, right? That you sit, uh, Jacob sit on sofa, that two leg is who? Who's two leg? Mike. <laughs> yeah. OK. You can see sometimes we abuse them. OK, so carrying a payload is also a challenge task. Because this robot has a lot of module, uh, lots of uh, motors by itself. Uh, one of the challenges people always ask us is, how much weight can you carry? So we figure out uh, one possibility that can carry a lot of weight. So this is a way. You have put your payloads into a long uh, a long thing cylinder maybe and you put on the Super Bowl modules along that cylinder and have them roll like that and you see here
Right now, this configuration, there are all superbowl module in it. But you can have the cylinders in the middle with the payload, and then you connect the modules on the side, as many as you want, and have them low. So that way, they can at least, we hope, to carry their own a weight that is equivalent to their body weight. I cannot imagine what this look like. I mean, there's no creature that does these things. <laughs> okay, so, and you can also use it as a conveyor conveyor belt by transfer dirt from one side to the other. This we have done it by hand. Uh, we're going to program this and have them, you know, moving dirt from one side to the other or some other objects from one side to the other. This is just a demonstration that is possible. And you can easily program and to do such a thing. Now, the stuff I showed you so far is what we call multifunctional, based on whatever configuration you give them. And each configuration can do different things. And you know it can be easily to do many tasks. Now, the question is, how do they reconfigure? Here is one simulation configured from one long chain to become a four-legged uh, robots. They have to dock, de-dock, dock, dock, and then do this kind of thing. And you have to plan them what is the best way to do such thing. You have an initial configuration. You have a target configuration. What are the minimum number of actions you take to allow them to change from one shape to the other? OK, that's a simulation. Now, in reality, first of all, you have to find your buddies. right? Say you want them to become a bigger body, and two guys want to come together. They have, should be able to find. So first of all, you have, they have to search. They use their infrared looking for buddies, for example. This is a way, one way to, to be able to look around. And two guys together can use those gates. One guy is looking. The other one is standing, just emitting the infrared signal, say, I'm here, I'm here, come. Uh, the other guy comes towards you. Okay. And then also, if, they, if you don't know who they are, where they are, and you have to do a little search. So this movie shows when robots have two modules, has two modules, are turning around, sending signals, trying to say, is anybody there? Is anybody there? Okay. And then if someone received that signal, it should be able to reply, says, yes, I'm here. So then it will go. You see, it's, it's receive a signal, say, and then adjust the direction, and then move towards it. I read somewhere on the internet, there's one guy specifically like this movie, saying that I feel sympathetic for this little guy trying to connect to their buddies. There, also, there still have a lot of open questions. For example, the connector right now we have on the module is a manual connector. It requires humans to look at them in the dark and have a screw. And the new version of the connector coming soon it will be automatic. Yeah. OK. So first step to reconfiguration is to be able to find each other and come in and do things together. Also, when you have a bigger robot, if you wanted to separate them and cut that leg off, cut the head off, or whatever, 
can they still survive? That's the question. So we call them as a relentless or resilient to sh huge ch uh, shape changes. In these robots, we deliberately cut the body in half. And the front part says, boy, I used to have someone behind me, but not anymore. It looks as his own current body says, I only have two legs, therefore I should do a butterfly. So it moves like a butterfly now. The, the later part also wakes up when time out, when it's waiting for the message to return, and look and says, huh, I used to have someone, someone in front of me, but not anymore. My current body has two legs, therefore I do a butterfly. Now, you can put them back again. You can even swamp the upper body with the lower body. And they will stop again and say, look, our body changed again. What is the best way to move? And then it will switch back to the four-leg movement. So we often tell our kids, don't do that at home to yourself. Don't cut. Basically, in these robots, you can literally cut the head off, and then they're still able to do things. They will not die. So another illustration is, it depends on how things are connected, they will do different behaviors. You saw it on the left hand side. In this movie, we're trying to show when the two modules are connected like this. Okay. They're doing a butterfly. When the time we make that movie, we haven't got the radio control. That's why I was manually. And then we all become a something called a, we call it a butterfly stroke. Okay. So now, if I turn. of a, a, a smaller module. You can start with a three small robots and dynamically connect them, and then we become a single one. This is starting with a sidewinder. If you take a piece from the body, connect it to the side, that piece will become a leg immediately. And then you keep doing, take a piece from the body, put another leg, another leg until they have four legs, and now they can move along by themselves. So this is something we call the light surgery. In the sense that you don't need to shut them down, you can rearrange the body parts when you want. Now you have four legs, you can go. The reason they will become a leg is because everybody is constantly detecting how do they connect to their neighbors to therefore conclude where they are in the body. It depends on the location in the body, they will decide what to do. Now, in addition to use hand to configure them, they can also autonomously configure by themselves. In this case, and the top movie shows two modules connect, aligned, and then they come in together. And this is an early version of a connector. They will connect and become one. This movie shows that the tail comes over, connects to the middle, and disconnect the loop and become a T-shape and moving around. 
this is a so-called, we call it a self-reconfiguration. So we are still working on the bigger ones and doing the same uh, capability. Okay. Now a little bit technical. This is only uh, maybe five to ten minutes. I will show you a, a glimpse of what is inside the software. So naturally, you, for this kind of a system, you have to consider three big areas. Mechanic systems, how the things are connected, electronics, and then the distributed control. Okay. For you guys, maybe the distributed control is a little more interesting because we, we said it could do shape-dependent behavior, and body parts can reshuffling, reconfigure, and also there is a not only the change shape, they can do more mobile uh, movement and uh, possibly in the future manipulation. So from software control point of view, here are the list of challenges that you have to address before you can write a good program for these robots. First of all, I mentioned there is no fixed brain module for these robots. You can cut the head off and somewhere else will take over. Furthermore, there's no even global unique identifiers. This is something very unique about these robots. And even you look at any PC or any system, you open it up, every component got to have an ID. Internet, everybody has to have an IP address. However, in biological system, the little cells, they come and go, they, they die, whatever. I don't think they have name, yet they always come together, manage to do things great together. That's why we were pushing ourselves. Didn't even give them names, no name. Furthermore, task negotiation means if one module says, I want to move forward, the other says, no, I want to move backwards, what are you going to do? So they have to negotiate among themselves to settle down a reasonable task. Behavior selection I mentioned is every module needs to decide what to do, not only based on who they are, but based on where they are in the body. That's called a behavior selection. And you can also, dynamic, you can think of these little guys with a lot of little computers connect to each other, forming a small network, or internet. However, the topology of the internet changes every time you reconfigure the robots. So it's a dynamic topology you have to deal with. Asynchronous means every module have their own little clock, but there is no global clock. So my watch could be like uh, 1255, and that watch is 1256, and your watch could be 1252. Yet, when they connect together, they have to synchronize in order to produce a desired global behavior. Scalability. And you really don't know beforehand what kind of a shape and size these robots will eventually become to in a certain environment. So whatever software you write has to be able to, flex, to, be able to be flexible enough to deal with many different shape and size. Okay. Now, of course, Eventually, we want them, we don't have yet, have themselves decide what kind of shape to become to. For example, suppose I want to grab that drink. Right now, because I'm a human, I have to walk around and then get it, right? If I'm a robot like them, I can take my left arm off, connect to my right arm, and try to reach it. If it's not enough, I take my leg and put another one, and then we we'll grab that. So things like these is very challenging, and you can imagine and what kind of a job is needs to be done. So people have been working on these in a different area. If you imagine different area, we have a different solution. But we're looking for one solution that allow them to handle many cases. So this is something we call, finally, we're now touch, talking about digital hormone and hormone-inspired control. This is an idea borrowed from the biological system. Uh, imagine a system or a biological 
system like myself, if someone scare me from behind, uh, there's a chemicals flooding in my blood and causing different body parts to do different reactions. So in this case, a hormone in this system is nothing but a content-based message. It has no identify, no address. It's just floating inside. And uh, has a lifetime. And uh, the key part is this message will trigger different actions at a different place. Really depends on who you are. So you have a one message flooding into your system. The leg will decide to jump. And your mouth will decide to open. And your eyes will pop. They're all one signal. Okay? And they're different from broadcasting because along the way of propagating, things get changed. There's no guarantee that everybody gets the same copy. And there's no external deposit like a, a pheromone. I, know, I don't know if you're familiar with multi-agent control. Some people use pheromone trying to mimic the ants. When the ants go out search for food, they deposit something along the way so the other ants can follow. In this case, everything is internal. Uh, eventually, we wanted to be able to use this, not only program them, but also dynamically change their behavior on the fly. We haven't done that yet. Okay. So then, five minutes, I will show you some quick examples. And you can imagine how things are co connected. These are the a one module, two module, uh, four module, and six module. Each module inside, they have a orientation front, back, left, and right. And uh, everybody is running the same program, and it depends on where they are to decide the actions. And you can see, use them for many different purposes, such as communication, locomotion, and reconfiguration, etc. So, I can give you an example of how this thing works. Say you have six modules want to move in a caterpillar. And the easy way or centralized way is to send a message to every one of them and say, now go do it. But if you use this approach, you can send one message to your neighbor. Just say, here's what I'm doing, and you decide what you do. And then this message propagate. Everybody select their action, and they start doing things. By the time the message goes to the very end, that guy says, I don't have any neighbors anymore. So because the topology is different, it decides to send a synchronization message back. That synchronization message, when you receive such thing, you look at your own action, see if you finish it or not. If you haven't finished, you hold on that message until you finish and you propagate. So by the time it, this signal backs to the first guy, the guy says, OK, everybody has done their job. It's time for another wave, something like that. So why bother to do these things? One advantage is you can cut the robots in half. You don't need to change the program. It will work the same way. Furthermore, you don't care how long the snake is. Okay? So these kind of things are uh, interesting. And this is another example how things are changing from one four-legged creature to a snake. What it does is, the tail comes over to connect one of the foot, then disconnect from the hip. So a leg becomes part of your tail. Then this new tail comes over, connects to another foot, and disconnect the hip, and become a longer tail. And you keep doing this until there's no more leg left, and then you become a snake. Okay? And this is something that you can do it distributedly without any centralized control. I will not have time to, to tell you the details. And you can use this approach for many other purposes of uh, uh, distributed control, other things you need to do. And I will skip this. Application-wise, you, you can apply this principle to real biological system. If you're interested, I'll tell you more about that. And also, swarm of robots. Assembly in space, and underwater robots, and also self-healing system. So if you have a system, something goes wrong, you can literally take a human body and cut it in half. Not human body, somebody's body. 
And then these two half will become a too little human. Well, of course, human cannot do that, but some creatures can do that, and we're working on that. Can you imagine? <laughs> that would be good. So let me conclude. So it's one, five past one, so it's okay. Self-reconfiguration is a very fundamental research topic. Uh, we, we always say it's a gold mine. You keep digging. There are a lot of things come out. And they have also have many possible applications. For example, search and rescue. When the building collapsed, and you want to send the robots to be able to change and go anywhere they want to, and fix the shape, robots might not be able to do that. Hum homeland security and self-assembly in space, smart structures, and many other possibilities. So finally, I wanted to, to appreciate your attention. Here's a, a little robot. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. That's it. So by the way, all the movies are actually at the website. Uh, show up at the website. It's www.isi.edu slash robots. Or you just type superbot in Google and you find it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.